A few years ago, I found myself after a, a surgery preaching for a few weeks supported by a stool, and so today I find myself again preaching, uh, sitting down, not out of disrespect, but out of necessity. But actually, if you remember, uh, Keith had similar surgery a while back, and I figured if Keith could lead worship with one arm, I can preach with one arm. So, uh, so I'm going to do it today. You know, over the past few days, there have been times in which there's been a lot of discomfort in those things, and as I would sit there and lament a bit, uh, I found myself going to 2 Corinthians 11. Now, you don't have to go there now, but sometime if you want to do that, that's Paul's accounts of what he went through, and any time that you feel like life's tough, just go read what Paul went through, and kind of changes one's perspective. But I, I will share this. While I don't share in the persecutions and the trials, troubles, tribulations that Paul experienced, I do share uh, some things with him. And, and chief on that list is what he shared in 1 Corinthians 9, 16. And he said this, he said, For I preach the gospel. If I preach the gospel, I have nothing to boast of, for necessity is laid upon me. Yes, woe is me if I do not preach the gospel. And I have to tell you that, you know, there were, were moments in which I said, well, I'll just, you know, go a little bit slower and not come back. And also, I actually had a person prepared who is seated in this congregation that if I was unable to uh, preach, they were ready to go. However, it does not mean if you don't like what I say that you can holler substitute and, uh, and bring in somebody, somebody else. You didn't like the windblown look? Okay. But, you know, as, as I thought about today and I thought about uh, God, the call that God placed on my life, I, I couldn't help but think of the words that we read in Jeremiah 20, verse 9. Jeremiah finding himself at a time in life when he had really struggled and was going through a lot, and, and he just said, you know, I just want to quit. And, uh, and he said, but there was this fire that was burning within me. And he said, I tried to hold back the words of God, and I could not. And, uh, and that's the way we need to be, folks where uh, we, it just won't stay in, and certainly that for me, and in all sincerity, even though it's one week, I, I desperately miss uh, friends and flock at this place, and so we come back today to share and to share about the gospel, and we ask ourselves, what brings us here today? And first and foremost, we come here to worship God. That's number one on the list above everything that we do, and we do that through the praise that we offer in songs and fellowship and study and all of the other parts of the church uh, that we engage in. Uh, it's a place in which we show our faith. Because you see, no matter what we're doing in here, as we praise, as we pray, as we listen to the word, whatever, we are acknowledging that God exists and we're acknowledging a dependence upon him and a desire to communicate with him and a communication that's not one way, but a communication that comes back to us as well. And so we're going to do that today, and every time that we gather, there are important words to share. And they're not important because I share them or anybody else that sits up here shares them. They're important because they come from God. And when we share, every single verse and every single word that comes out of this book is a revelation. Now, not in terms of something new, I hope not, but in terms of something that God has revealed to us about himself and about what he desires in us. Today he's going to do that, like every Sunday, as we talk about faith. And if you want to boil down today's message to just a sentence, our question, it would be this. Faith, are you in or out? And so I want you to take your Bibles and turn to the book of Joshua. And we're going to share from there almost exclusively today. I'll share a few other verses with you, but the, that's going to be our focus today as we share. And I want to kind of set the scene for you as you do that. You're probably familiar with this passage. It's an incredible passage of Scripture with so many lessons. But in it, the people of Israel find themselves uh, on the banks of the Jordan River. They are in the wilderness where they have wandered for many, many years. And now they stand on the banks of the Jordan River looking across at the land that God has promised to them. Here they are, and there it is generations, decades, everything that's been involved has led them to this point in which they are staring at that which God has promised he would give them. But there's only one problem. Between them and where they want to be is the Jordan River. 
and it is at flood stage. Now, lest you think we're talking about a trickle or a stream, it is totally impassable, and from any human sense, it is impossible. They cannot get from where they are to the other side on their own. There is no bridge. There is no boat. There are no materials. By the way, there's two million of them. They can't get over there. And they're on the edge of the Jordan. God's going to give to them an incredible lesson about faith and call to faith. And is going to give us a great lesson about how faith works and what happens when we do respond in faith and step out in faith. Because you see, standing and sitting on one side of the river, there ain't but one way to get to the other side. And that's through faith. So we're going to share about that today, and the first thing is that faith is sown in the promises of God. Now, I wasn't sure how good I'd do today, <laughs> not that I do good any Sunday, but uh, didn't know how I'd be, so I lined up some help with these verses, and I think Madison, where is Madison? There she is. Madison's going to come up, and she's going to read the first scripture passage. It's in Joshua chapter 1. And she's going to share verses 1 through 9. So listen carefully or follow along as Madison reads. After the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, it came to pass that the Lord spoke to Joshua, the son of Nun, Moses' assistant, saying, Moses, my servant, is dead. Now therefore, arise and go over this Jordan, you and all these people, to the land in which I'm giving to them, the children of Israel. Every place that the sole of your foot will tread upon, I have given to you, I said to Moses, from the wilderness to this Lebanon, and this Lebanon, as far as the great river, the river Euphrates, all the land of the Hittites to the great sea, towards the going down of the sun, shall be your territory. No man shall be able to stand before you all the days of your life. As I was with Moses, so I will be with you. I will not leave you nor forsake you. Be strong and of good courage, for this these people you shall divide as an inheritance the land, which I swore to their fathers to give to them. Only be strong and very courageous, that you may observe to do according to the law which Moses my servant commanded you. Do not turn from it to the right hand or to the left, that you may prosper wherever you go. This book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate on it day and night, that you may observe to do according to what is written. For then you will make your way prosperous, and then you will have good success." Have I not commanded you? Be strong and of good courage. Do not be afraid, nor be dismayed. For the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. Now, let's take those verses. And, I mean, there's nine of them, and so uh, let's, let's reduce them down a little bit. Uh, Moses has died. That's God's chosen leader. And God has come to Joshua, and now Joshua is the leader of the children of Israel. Uh, and in this conversation, God reminds Joshua of the promises that he made to Moses about how he would care for his people and where he would take them. And those promises are all important to the faith that Joshua and the people that are following him have to follow now. See, God has promised first, I'm going to give you a land that's going to be just yours. He said, I'm going to take you there. By the way, I'm promising you that no one there will be able to stand against you. I'm going to lead you there, care for you there, provide for you there, protect you there. In the same way that I was with Moses, I'm going to be with Joshua as he leads you there. And if you noticed in the last verse, really important verse, verse 9, he says, doesn't make any difference where you go, I'm going to be there with you. Now why is that so important? Well, Joshua and the people are about to be called upon to really, really display their faith. Now understand this. I mean, Joshua knows that on the other side is the promised land, but he doesn't know how it's going to go. I mean, they've sent spies. They've got to check it out and that kind of thing. But generally, he doesn't know what awaits, and there he stands with a, an impassable river. And behind him are two million more folks who really don't know what's going to happen. They don't know how it's going to work out or anything else. So all they have to rely upon and to draw upon are the promises of God. Now, folks, listen carefully. God's promises are not qualified. God didn't say, I'm going to get you there as long as the Jordan's not flooded. I'm, I'm going to get you there, but if we run into some trouble along the way, then it may not work out. He said, I'm going to get you there. And so they have to look back to that and claim that as they stand there and prepare for what God has for them. 
Now, we walk through this, and an important part of this is to say, well, this is an historical account, and it's also an account from God which has been given to us to, to teach us and to help us. So what's God saying to you and to me? Individually, collectively, as First Baptist Church of Blanchard. I mean, obviously, we don't know a lot of the things that are ahead of us. We look, we pray, we seek, we listen. But God reveals those at the appropriate time and in the way that he desires. But what we do have are the promises of Scripture from God that say a lot to us. I mean, promises like we find in Jeremiah 29, 11 through 13, where God tells us, I know the plans that I have for you. They're for peace, not evil. They're good, not bad. He says, if you come to me and you pray to me, I'm going to listen to you. He says, you'll find me, you seek me and find me when you search for me with all your heart. That's a promise of God. In Philippians 1, 6, he says, being confident of this very thing, that he who has begun a good work in you will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. That is a promise of God. Acts 1, 8, you shall receive power. When the Holy Spirit comes upon you, you're going to be witnesses to me in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, the ends of the earth. That's a promise of God, and it is unqualified. Sometimes we tend to focus more on the uncertainties than the certainties, and, and the people of Israel sure could have done that. How, how is this going to work out? I mean, this is crazy. We'll never get over there. It's too big, can't handle it, all of those things. But what God says is, here's what you need to do. Don't worry about the uncertainties. You, you focus on the certainties. And here's the certainty. I'm God. I can handle it. And he reminds them of this there. And he says to them, you must never be afraid to trust an unknown future to a known God, which is completely contrary to what we typically do in our lives. We, wanna, we consider that which surrounds us as the known and that which we can't see, feel, touch, taste. As the unknown, God says you got it backwards. That which is absolute and known is me, and that which surrounds you is the uncertainties that come with you, humanity. And he tells us that's the essence of faith. And the essence of faith is placing all dependence upon God. And that's why he says you don't need to walk with your eyes. You need to walk with your faith. Because walking in faith takes courage. And it also takes preparation. Now, you know, if we look at this right now, everything seems to be going fairly well probably until they got over the hill or got near the river and went, uh-oh, wrong time. Jordan's flooded. You can't get across. The only way from this side to the other side is to do what God says to do. And so what are we going to do? Now, it's interesting in this, and we're not going to dwell on it, but it's interesting in this that there's a re little reflection of what many of us would do. Now, I'm not going to read it, but if you look in verse 4 of Joshua 3, God pretty much says this. He says, whatever you do, do what I tell you. Don't get ahead of me. Don't do it your own way. Not that we would. But he says, don't get ahead of me. I want you to do it exactly like I tell you, because if you do it exactly like I tell you, then you are displaying faith in who I am and what I tell you. And he says, rather than get ahead of me and try to do it your own way, People of Israel, here's what I want you to do. Now look at verse 5 of Joshua 3. Joshua said to the people, Sanctify yourselves, for tomorrow the Lord will do wonders among you. Now, some of you in your verses, it may say to consecrate yourself. But consecration and sanctification are basically the same thing. They are the spiritual process of being set apart. When God says to be holy as I am holy, he is saying to be consecrated, to be sanctified, to be set apart. And so as God directs Joshua in this all-important step of faith, he says, let's walk through it and understand this. You've got to be prepared to step out in faith. And the way that you prepare yourself is to consecrate yourself. And I often think that Perhaps they came and probably did come to the edge of the river, not prepared for what they were going to be asked to do, much as you and I do that as well. You know, standing at the edge of a flooded river and knowing that you're supposed to go across, it's a pretty scary thing. So is something you've never done before. So is something that's completely out of your comfort zone. 
So it's something that you think about and say, that's the last thing I ever want to do. See, God puts God-sized task in front of us. And why is that? In God-sized task, one, it calls upon us to use our faith. And two, in God-sized task, when accomplished, the only one that can get glory for it is God. If I do something that I can do without looking to God, then I get a pat on the back, and that's, that's not worth anything. If I do something that only God can do through me and my faith that brings a result that draws attention to him, then he gets the credit and he gets the glory. And so God says, I want you to prepare for what's about to happen. Now notice what, what Joshua says. Folks, go out there and get ready spiritually. Get ready because you ain't going to believe what's going to happen tomorrow. God's going to do wondrous work and things that we can't really see. Now, I'm sure they did a lot of things. For you and me, there are things that, that we do in our preparation, and prayer is at the top of that list. To genuinely submit ourselves to conversation and communication with God and open our heart to what he has. And there was probably a whole bunch of prayers going on right there by the Jordan River. God tells us to pursue godliness, to set aside those things that are worldly and secular and to focus on him. And all of that is part of this consecration process and preparing ourselves for what God has to do. And in this particular passage, some versions refer to what's going to happen as the workings of God, miracles, those type things. Whatever it is, it's a supernatural occurrence that can only be attributed to God. You know, this isn't a sudden cessation and stopping of waters that's going to take place because somebody built a dam up the road. It's only going to take place because the people have prepared themselves. They're going to step in faith and be obedient, and God's going to bring it about. And so we want to look at that, and Keith is going to read the next passage that comes from chapter 3, verses 6 through 13. Then Joshua spoke to the priests, saying, Take up the Ark of the Covenant and cross over before the people. So they took up the Ark of the Covenant and went before the people. And the Lord said to Joshua, This day I will begin to exalt you in the sight of all Israel, that they may know that I, as I was with Moses, so I will be with you. You shall command the priests who bear the Ark of the Covenant, saying, When you have come to the edge of the water of the Jordan, you shall stand in the Jordan. So Joshua said to the children of Israel, Come here and hear the words of the Lord your God. And Joshua said, By this you shall know that the living God is among you, and that he will without fail drive out from before you the Canaanites and the Hittites and the Hivites and the Perizzites and the Girgashites and the Amorites and the Jebusites. Behold, the ark of the covenant of the Lord of all the earth is crossing over before you into the Jordan. Now therefore take for yourselves twelve men from the tribes of Israel, one man from every tribe, and it shall come to pass as soon as the soles of the feet of the priests who bear the ark of the Lord, the Lord of all the earth shall rest in the waters of the Jordan, that the waters of the Jordan shall be cut off, the waters that come down from upstream, and they shall stand as a heap. Keith's too kind to say it, but he's probably wondering, how come I got all those names? But uh, he did good. Let's take a second and look at what's taking place here, folks. This is the ark of the covenant. Uh, it's actually a special, special container that's been built by God's directions. It's 45 inches long, 27 inches wide, and 27 inches deep. It's made of acacia wood. It's the only piece of furniture that will rest in the Holy of Holies in the temple. And it houses the Ten Commandments. Those tablets which God has written with his own finger. The most precious thing that the people of Israel hold. They have been given that to protect it, to guide them, and to direct them. And now God tells them, this is how you're going to get across the Jordan River. He says, I want you to go to the edge. Get everybody lined up in a particular way. And it was customary for the priest to carry the ark anyway. But he said, they're going to be at the front of the line. And he says, when their sandals touch that water, it will stop. It will build up on both sides, and there will become a way for the ark and all of my people to cross to that place that I promised them they would have. Now, you don't have to raise your hand, but who would have gone, yeah, right? That plan will never work. Or 
who would have drifted to the back of the two million? You know, I'm going to see if this works before I step out there. But you see, God calls for that faith. That's what he says to the people. He says, I want you to step in. And it's, it's not by chance that first in line are priest and the ark. That which is most precious. See, you're not going to send a test out there. You're not going to put somebody you don't like and shove them out there to see if it works. You're not going to put your finger in and see if it's really true. We're going all in. We're going everything that matters is going to touch that water if you have faith. See, folks, when you mix God's will with faith, God's sized miracles come about. It happens. It's what's there. When we consecrate ourselves and listen to what God's telling us, then he brings about those things that bring him glory. And so he said to his people, I want you to prepare and I want you to listen. But there's one more thing. I want you to obey. He shared his promises. He shared the plan for consecration, his call to consecration, the plan he has of how they are to get across. And now it's time for faith to become action. Listen carefully. Abby's going to read for us verses 14 through 17 of Joshua 3. So it was when the people set out from their camp to cross over the Jordan with the priests bearing the Ark of the Covenant before the people and as those who bore the ark came to the Jordan, and the feet of the priests who bore the ark dipped in the edge of the water, for the Jordan overflows all its banks during the whole time of the harvest, that the waters which came down from upstream stood still, and rose in a heap very far away at Adam, the city that is beside Zaratan. So the waters that went down into the sea of the Arabah, the salt sea, failed and were cut off, and the people who crossed over opposite Jer Jericho. Then the priests who bore the Ark of the Covenant in the Lord stood firm on dry ground in the midst of the Jordan, and all Israel crossed over on dry ground until all the people had crossed completely over the Jordan. Now, when you and I read that, and when we hear that, here's the probability. <laughs> it worked. It really did dry up. But let me tell you something. It's often the case in Scripture, if we're not careful, we'll miss as important a part of this passage as any other part. First three words. Did you hear what they were? So it was. You know what that is? That's an affirmation of faith. Now God's the one that brought this about, but he brought it about because he exercised their faith. If you take out so it was, God did a miracle. But we didn't see a display of faith. But what we see there is the, the affirmation that they said we prepared ourselves and now we are obeying. God's plan worked. It dried up. Everybody went across, even the doubters. You ever wonder if any of them ran across? I think about that. But they all went across. They all exercised their faith. You ever wonder if some of them were scared? I do. I hear preachers and pastors say, if you got faith, you'll never be afraid. Let me tell you something, folks. I've had faith and I've been afraid. Faith does not exclude fear. Faith excludes inaction. If you have faith, you cannot sit still. But our humanity is still going to bring into us through emotions, the circumstances, whatever, those things that just weigh on us. But that's not the issue, you see. The issue, you don't see in here where he says every single one of them were jumping up and down with joy and running to the front. What you see is they all acted in faith. And that's an important part of this. Instead of looking at the enormity of what faced them, Remember again, impassable, impossible. They look to the promises of God and exercise their faith. And so it was. Jim Cimbala has written several little books, great little books. One of them is entitled Fresh Faith. And uh, he, he talks about the absence of faith and what would happen if the people of God, their faith really was ignited and really displayed and how it would just affects so many things outside the door, inside the doors as well. And in his book, Fresh Faith, he addresses that issue of how we stand before the enormity of a God-sized task and, and how sometimes our knees weaken a bit as we think about what lies ahead. And, and Simbala shared this. He said, wherever God leads us, there's an umbrella of protection and supply that stays over our heads. 
And under that umbrella are the divine resources of wisdom, grace, finance, and all the other things we need to do what God has asked. And that doesn't mean there won't be problems and difficulties. But wherever the Lord leads, he must then by necessity help us. Now ask yourself, why did God give us this story? Why did he tell us about what happened there? I mean, it's not just so we would have an historical account of how some folks got across the river. This whole book is the revelation of God to, to us. God says, this is who I am, and this is how I work, and this is what I expect of you. So I'm going to tell you these and give you these accounts, and I'm giving you this one, not so you'll look back and say, yay, people of Israel, but so you'll understand how you can count on my promises, you can act in faith, and I'll bring about the results. And his faith is shown in preparation, and faith that's rather shown in the promises of God. It's, it's grown as we prepare for it, and then we show it through obedience. So how does it work in our lives? And there's, and there's so many different ways that these come up. You know, somebody says to me, what is, uh, what's your call as a pastor? In 2 Peter, it says to me that I'm to lead by example and not by compulsion, to shepherd this flock. I'm to display faith. Uh, and, and I can tell you that, you know, uh, Marsha and I tithe in everything we receive. We give offerings to faith promise offering to ministries in this church, ministries outside this church. And I, I don't do that in, in any sense to boast, but I do it as a testimony to God's provision and a recognition of my accountability to this flock. But I also want to tell you this. I lay up far too many treasures here on earth where moth and rust will destroy and thieves will break in and steal. I lay up too many things that do not have eternal value. And that which has eternal value is that which shares the gospel and disciples others. And it's where we should be placing our faith and activating our faith. Everything that you and I have and everything that we are is to be invested into the kingdom of God. Alistair Begg provided a quote that's a great synopsis of the lessons that we shared today. He says that faith in every day and every generation, the command of God, the accompanying promises of God, and the step of obedience. Now, folks, as we look at this passage and as we draw near the end, I want us to get personal. I mean real personal. Where's your Jordan River? Have you looked for it? Let me help you a little bit. I want you to walk out there when we're through or some other time into the foyer of this church and stand before the plans for a new children's building and what God has laid before us. And then I want you to look down. And when you do, you're going to see the edge of the Jordan River. I want you to drive by the orchard, hub ministry, disaster relief, Bozier Rescue Ministry, Crisis Pregnancy Center. When you do, look down, see the Jordan River. I want you to come outside this church one day and see people who walk out with bags of food and necessities and look down and see the Jordan River. Outside in that foyer is a table for the Belize mission trip. For participation through going, through prayer, through giving. Go look at that table and look down and see the Jordan River. It's all around us, folks. It's the things that God has put in front of us. How on earth can we do that? We do it through faith. We do it through counting on the promises of God. And you see, right now, let me tell you absolute certainty. Every single one of us in this place is standing on the edge of the Jordan. Every one of us. Don't dismiss this as something, a lesson to be taught in the worst moments of life. Don't dismiss it as something that only comes in the biggest points of our existence. It's part of who we are. And you need to look down. We need to look down. Just ahead of our toes is the water. Somebody here today may be standing on the banks of the Jordan River of Salvation. Right now, you might be standing there 
And God's saying, listen, here's my promise. I love you so much, I gave my son for you. He died for you. He was resurrected for you. And you can have it. But let me tell you what, I'm not going to pull you in that water. I'm not going to give you floaties, and I'm not going to give you a certainty. you got to step. He says, take that step, watch what happens. Take a real step of faith and watch what happens inside. For some, you know, you've been praying about, God, where do you want me to be? Where do I place my loyalties in a local church? God promises this. He says, I place the members in the body as I please. But you say, you know, I'm just not sure. Well, maybe you're not. But if you are, God says to you, look down. Right in front of you is some water. You need to take a step. Folks, it may be tithe. It may be giving. I promise you this, it's sacrifice. God may be laying on every heart here. I got something for you to do, but you got to exercise faith. And he'll be glorified. Incredible, incredible story in that book. But see, when you walk out of here, we're not walking out of here saying, I know a little bit more about those Israelites. We better walk out here saying, I know a whole bunch more about God, what he wants. We're going to have an invitation. Any way you want to look at it, here's what an invitation is. It's an opportunity to express faith. Let's bow together.